look at H.G. Wells' First Mind on the Moon, uh, which is a best, I mean, it's called science fiction. Um, I think you could also classify it as a scientific romance. And when I say romance, I don't mean it in the sense that there's any sense of uh, romantic interest in it. That's not a part of it. But romance, rather, in the genre of the fantastic, which we see in the uh, medieval period. So sometimes called speculative fiction as well. And um, published in a serialized form. In other words, it came out in installments, just like Dickens, uh, on a on like a, a weekly basis from December 1900 to August 1901. So that's how it was first published. So you can imagine here it is however many chapters. Uh, I can't remember how many chapters. 25 chapters. Uh, the genre or the means. Uh, by which it was first published, explains something of the um, experience of it. The chapters are roughly the same length, and they tend to end with a little bit of a cliffhanger, come back next week and read the next installment. So um, it has its limitations. It's not the greatest story ever written, but it's interesting. And it is in the foray of science fiction, part of which we explored last time uh, in relation to Frankenstein. Uh, the idea of the scientist um, pushing frontiers. And now they have uh, been pushed to what we conventionally associate with science fiction, namely the realm of outer space. And uh, Lewis will particularly appeal to this book when he writes his uh, sci-fi trilogy, and in particular the first uh, work, Out of the Silent Planet. Um, but I'll, I'll say more about that next time. Uh, it has, it's, it's very, it becomes quite formulaic in its structure. There are two main protagonists. One is a businessman, his name is Mr. Bedford, and the other is a scientist who's Mr. Caver. Caver invents a substance called caverite. Bedford is a scientist who tries to make money writing plays, sort of an un odd thing in a sense. You don't expect that of a businessman. Uh, but he, uh, Caver leads uh, Bedford and he and Caver meet because they're neighbors. And you'll see the plot line uh, m fairly closely approximated by Lewis in Out of the Silent Planet. It begins that way. There's a neighbor, there's something going on. And the one neighbor gets involved in the other's business and uh, things progress from there. Um, and uh, Bedford finds out that Caver has invented this substance which allows for, uh, he negates the, the force of gravity. This is what Caver, Caverite does. It effectively goes up into, um, straight up into outer space. And uh, Bedford recognizes the practical utility of this, or where money can be made. So you have two sides of it. You have, on the one hand, you've got the scientists inventing things, but then you have the practical man that's implementing it and finding that there's uh, a use uh, for it and that can be monetized. But the one is, pr is motivated by, by money, and the other is just pure scientific interest, uh, at least apparently so. And uh, I mean, I'm, not, I'm going to skip over the first few chapters in the sense of not repeating what they say. I'm going to just summarize it. But what happens is Caver proposes that they go up to the moon with this because he's a scientist and he wants to explore something that had not been explored thus far, be of great humanitarian benefit. Bedford is not so keen on the idea because there's no money in it. So what's, what do I care about exploring? the moon. There's no money in it. Uh, but in agree, in, they do agree to do that. Now, the way that works is that the, they produce this sort of uh, round spacecraft, which is 
covered by a layer of, of metal and you can pull the, let, the, the metal steel shutters back and expose the calvarite and the calvarite will pull upwards. Because as soon as calvarite is exposed, it immediately goes up into the air. So you just have to pull the shutters back, the calvarite's exposed and this pulls you off. Now how this would work, it doesn't matter. It's not explained, it's totally, um, it's quite frankly absurd doesn't matter for the purposes of the fiction. The purpose of the fiction, for as far as Lewis is concerned, is this is fantasy. As I say, it's science fantasy, if you will, or scientific romance. Uh, but going back to Lewis's description of the sorts of science fiction that interests him, this interests him because it has the element of fantasy about it. So the, the fact that's, that uh, Cavorite would never really, is an implausible proposal, like barely credible, right? There's this substance that flies off. Well, how did you get this substance and how come it doesn't all fly off immediately as soon as you expose it? Well, you'd, I guess you'd have to cover it all up inside or I, and it goes, I don't know. Anyway, um, but, uh, but interestingly, Bedford, uh, here's a comment that's worth noting. He immediately says that this could be a source of wealth enough to work any sort of so social revolution we fancied we might own and order the whole world. That's his observation. So there's an interesting observation right away. The man of business is not only interested in uh, wealth, but also in power and social control. And that's the early beginning in a very subtle way of addressing the, the issue that Mary Shelley does in Frankenstein. Frankenstein, I think it's presented in far more insidious fashion. At least it, becomes that way, but at first it's more naive. But here it's not so naive, because they immediately, uh, or Bedford immediately hits upon the idea that it might be a means of social control and power over other human beings. And that becomes a dominant theme in the novel. Uh, I'll talk about that more when we get later in the book. A question though, or a comment. Uh, that's a Marxist idea that they do, and I don't think that that immediately occurs to uh, the British in the same way it does in a Marxist sense, because power is associated with uh, the aristocracy. There's a certain sense in which power is not dependent on wealth, and there's a certain sense in, in, in the sort of class structure of Britain that although the aristocrats are often wealthy, there can be other people there who are wealthier and they're not given quite the same access to power. Now they may demand it and they may push in that direction, but they're not, there's not a one for one link that money equals power. We tend to do that here, uh, associate people with wealth, with, with power and even a desire for power uh, to exercise their wealth for that. And people will do the same thing with their uh, notoriety or celebrity. They want to use it for some cause, right, that they think to be good, social change, etc. It's just interesting that, that Bedford immediately comes to that thought. It's not just money, we'll be wealthy, I'll be able to not have to work anymore or who knows what, but he wants to do it in relation to other people. And that, I think, becomes a dominant theme in science fiction. Uh, that science is used uh, in the name of human betterment is used to gain power over one's fellow creatures. And, and back when we looked at the abolition of man in my last class, I think we're going to do it again in, in this class. I think that's the next uh, text that we have. Uh, in the third chapter, which is called the abolition of man, he explicitly says that gaining power over nature is never done for humanity's sake, is never done on behalf of all humanity, but is done by some, and it ex it, they wield power over their fellow humans, but not on behalf of them equally distributed. It ends up being a, a, a scientific elite that benefits from this. And uh, he could have taken that directly from this novel, 
that he observes the very same thing. So Bedford immediately sees it not only as a source of wealth, but of, of social power, political power. And you could give him, although I don't think it's in the novel, you could attribute to him good motives. He wants to alleviate poverty. He wants to get rid of crime. He wants to, I know, who knows what, um, ameliorate human uh, suffering make in, in some sense. But there's no such good motivations attributed to him. He simply wants to gain power over people, and it's just left at that. And maybe that fits in with the idea that he's, he's a, a businessman. Right? He's not a philanthropist. And so it certain fits into that certain template, uh, which I think sticks with the genre and, and doesn't go away. And that a lot, once, once you get certain conventions associated with any genre of literature, a later writer can immediately assume that his audience expects that and can play with it. They can deviate from it, they can seek to speak against it, they can tweak it a bit, or they can just totally sabotage it, which is what Lewis will do in his sci-fi. I think he deals with the conventions of science fiction, all the associations, the assumptions, because he's assuming that his readers uh, are also knowledgeable of at least the conventions of science fiction, even if they're not avid readers of it. And I think that he is probably correct in doing so, but it's hard by dint of the distance of time to know what Lewis's audience would have thought in the 1940s. Because now we have how much science fiction in TV and movies and books. I mean, it's dominant. There's so much in that. Um, and now you really can assume certain things. Um, but usually it's maligned. There's an insidious feature to exploring and to the scientific enterprise, which doesn't disappear until the 1960s uh, with things like Star Trek, where there's the United Federation of Planets, and actually we're all going to gather together all the different races of all the different planets in the whole galaxy, and we're all going to explore new worlds and new life and boldly go where no man had gone before all that, you know, the line. And, and there, we're going to have certain doctrines like the non-interference with life. You have, to, you have to leave the conditions as they are. That's a pushback against the expectations of, of science fiction, I think. And it's, it's probably a product of its era, the 1960s, where we're going to get, you know, we're going to uh, do things better than the previous generation. Right? We're not going to be just doing what has been done. We're, we, we've learned from the past, and we're, gonna, we're not going to interfere with other forms of life. I don't know if you know Star Trek. I grew up watching Star Trek. Okay. But they have this, the certain doctrines which they hold to be abs, and there's a sense of the equality of the races, and different, when I say races, I don't mean just black, white, China, I mean also alien races, like there's all, they're all serving and there's a certain sense of shared purpose and it's for the good, the general good of all things. And war is only for the purposes of, of uh, you know, just war. And so you get the sense, well, these are very good people and that's a much better future. It's utopian, right? So it's a utopian future that uh, science fiction starts to move towards come the 1960s. That's not the general sense of science fiction, however, and it, uh, the sense that science fiction could be motivated by um, malicious intent is all over the genre. And I, I would include under that things like 1984 and Brave New World, which are social experimentation and the effects of that uh, under this as well. Even though it's not properly speaking science fiction, it's still dystopian, futuristic, uh, fiction that uses science to change human nature. And I think Lewis is pushing it in that direction, and he is connecting the malignity to a certain view of technology and what people will do with that. And what they will do with it, as I say, he reveals in The Abolition of Man. He says that scientists don't do things out of a neutral perspective. And the people that fund science don't do it out of a neutral perspective. They do it whether they intend it or not. When you gain power over human nature and start doing eugenics, the outcomes are invariably 
going to be disadvantageous to some people and advantageous to others. Because when you, when you even raise the question of eugenics, what does it mean to be a better person? You're, along with it, making a judgment on what makes a worse person. Uh, and that will include everything from moral character to uh, genetic inheritance and so forth. And that, it, I, I think it comes along with, um, with Darwinism and the premises of Darwinism, which is that uh, human beings, and Lewis talks about this in uh, The Abolition of Man as well, right at the beginning, uh, describes the view of the educators of their view of mankind as we're effectively trousered apes. We just wear clothes now. And, and we are more civilized, but basically we evolved from, um, from apes, and now we're evolving into something else. And then there are several questions. One of them is, what is that thing we're evolving into? What will that look like? And H.G. Wells is going to address that to some degree. Because the, the society that he sees on the moon, the Selenites, as he calls them, Selenus is the moon goddess in Greek mythology, um, are highly intelligent, super advanced, more advanced than what's going on, on on Earth. And they also have features of their society which we do not have. And one of them is that they have an, an infinite variety of specialization. And their biology has been adapted to that. So they're bred for certain tasks. So the Grand Selenite is this, has an enormous head. Like he's just all brain. He's the big brain, literally, right? But that's his purpose, that he, he, that's what he does. He, he sees things, he directs things, he uh, orchestrates things for the, for the common good. And then there's the workers that are bred for very specific functions and they have uh, appendages that will suit that function, but they're bred for that purpose. Huxley does the same thing in Brave New World. There's the alphas, the betas, the gammas, whatever. And some of them are required for you know, some more high level directive type thing. They're the ones that are organizing and benefiting from the system. And then there are those uh, who are uh, in the womb given a dose of alcohol so they are effectively um, unintelligent, suffer like fetal alcohol syndrome basically. And that, but that's an intended effect. Uh, and yet they're all happy because they're given as much soma, which is a drug, and as much sex as they want. And it basically, there's no, there's no rituals, there's no sort of sense of uh, propriety. It's just, you, okay, that's fine. And, that, and that's the brave new world Huxley presents. Uh, Wells isn't talking about planet Earth directly. Huxley is talking about it directly. Wells is talking about it indirectly. So he, ta he looks at planet, uh, the, the Lune here, the, uh, the Selenites, and he notes things about them that are like his society, but also unlike it. And it's the conversations between Bedford and Caver and the Selenites, which gives rise to the real sharp social critique of modern science. Because one of the things that shocks the Grand Lunar is that, the, uh, that human beings uh, are at war with one another and they don't distribute things and they don't specialize and they get greedy and they, they are horribly inefficient and they regard their own kind uh, as, as their enemies. And the Grand Selenite comes to the quite logical conclusion, if you're willing to do this to your own kind, why will you not do it to people who are unlike you? And the answer is they would. And so that begins the War of the Worlds, another book, but effectively an invasion. Okay, so if this is what your nature is like, then why would I let you come here under the auspices of some sort of mutual beneficial pact, which actually you're going to break because that's what you do, and you're going to destroy my world? Well, I'm going to stop you right there. So it questions, and this is very interesting, it questions the view of human nature that's been uh, there from the beginning of the Enlightenment, which is that humanity 
is born good. And they get perverted, they become evil, but they're not by nature evil. They're not, they don't have a sin nature. They're not affected by original sin. That's what the Enlightenment says. They say that the doctrine of original sin, which the church teaches, is false. And if we want to get rid of the problem that we associate with sin, crime, war, poverty, famine, murder, rape, theft, all we need to do is go back to nature. Because the problem is society, society is corrupt. If we get rid of the social problem and get more to our natural state, then we will get rid of the consequences which we all agree are bad. There's nobody who thinks that murder is a good thing, or very few, or theft, or war, or famine. The, everyone will condemn these things. But the, in the Enlightenment period, there's a belief that if we get back to nature and things that are more natural, it will be uh, better for us all. And that is embedded in many of our, I think, our basic assumptions to this very day. Uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, it's best in relation to food, because it's a good illustration. If I give you something and say this is natural, are you going to eat it? And the, almost invariably so. If I give you something else and say, well, you should have this, this is artificial, it's, it's, it tastes great. What would, your <laughs> what would your response be? It would be, and if I give you a choice between the two, you're going to take the natural thing. right? So there's this, right? Nobody, I've never, think, well, here's this great new artificial food, you should try it, because it, it tastes much better than the natural thing. They might have bought that in the 70s when I grew up. And I give you Captain Crunch and uh, whatever those uh, sweetened fruit, fruity flavors, uh, uh, you know, those awful, <laughs> terrible breakfast cereals. Which are, so fruit Loops, yeah which are 90% sugar or something like that. And you, you do feel better because when you eat them, you're just like flying. It's like, this is great. <laughs> but it's terrible for you. Now, people acknowledge that now. Now, they even put sugar in your fries at McDonald's. Like, everything here has sugar in it. Literally, if you, if you come to North America from elsewhere in the world, you immediately taste that they, they have added sugar to pretty much everything. You, you just get used to it. You don't, you don't taste it anymore. But then you crave it and you expect it and you add sugar to things as well. Well, this isn't sweet enough. Anyway, that's totally off topic. Artificial and natural. The natural is, the bias towards the natural is that whatever is natural is good. There's nothing wrong with it. It can't be harmful. Whatever's artificial is seen as its diametrical opposite. It is constructed and it must not be good for you. It's bad. So how do we get to the, a, a better outcome? Well, we, then, we just go more natural. Same thing is applied. The same sort of logic is applied to society as well. We need, need to decentralize. We need to get closer to a rustic life. We need to get rid of new technology, etc., and we will get rid of most of our problems. We'll become more local. That's the romantic view. So that, and that's, that's Rousseau's view of human nature, that he, uh, in, his, in his own heart, is a good man, but he is corrupted by society around him. So what's the solution uh, to be an antisocial, effectively? Uh, that carries over through the whole genre. There is a suspicion of, of science and so forth. Now. Come modern science, there's a difference between Rousseau and the Enlightenment, its presuppositions, and what happens in the 19th century. Because in the 19th century, science and society are not, so science is not only used to exploit the non human order, but also the human order. It's applied directly to human beings. We get the so, so called social sciences psychology, anthropology, sociology. These are brand new subjects. Mankind is the subject of the investigation. And the aim of all of them is to improve human nature. Lewis is highly suspicious of this. So is 
science fiction. They see, it's not because they're inherently suspicious. They can see the effect of the experiment before their own eyes. So I'll give, me, I'll give you another illustration. Cities, hard for you to imagine here because cities here are relatively new. But if you go to Europe or any area in the world where cities are older, China, um, many places in Asia, you'll find that the cities, unless they've been started from scratch, I'll put the, close the window for you. I was just, it was so hot last time that people are literally falling asleep. Um, the old cities look like spaghetti. If you looked at it from a map above, the streets cross like this. They don't go straight. They're all over the place. And one street, it, particularly I lived in England for almost a decade, and you'll, you'll start on a street that's called this, and it crosses another street, and then it gets, it has a different name as it crosses the street. It's another, and so you're just, it's impossible to find your way around. And the streets aren't straight, they curve, they twist, they, there's a bend here. Why is there a bend here? Well, because there used to be a big rock there and they decided to go around that or whatever. Or there's somebody's house there, so we'll just bend it around the house. Or Whereas when you go to North America, New York, as the prime example, it's set up on a grid system. They call it a block. Makes no sense to Europeans. Don't, don't use the word a block. It doesn't make, because a block depends on things being uh, laid out as blocks. Right? And so you'll have 1st Street, 2nd Street, 3rd Street, 4th, 5th, 5th, think of New York City, 5th Avenue. It will go, they'll, they'll number it all the way up and across, and it will be literally a grid. And so it's very easy to find your way around if you're a visitor there. So it's very rational, it's very planned, and, uh, and it fits the sociological view of man's control over the nat natural world. It reflects it, in fact. Same thing if you go to France, to uh, Versailles. You can see of a certain view of nature in the way they look at gardens and they construct them. The English garden is an overgrown, it looks like nobody's ever come here. Has anybody ever done any gardening here? Because it's like th things are like they're not, they're all mixed together. It looks like they lost their lawnmower or whatever because the grass is also growing up and so forth. It's more what it seems a little bit wild, even if it has been. Uh, tended to, which it has. The English are famous gardeners, but they don't have this idea of that the right way of that nature should look is it shouldn't be uh, in straight patterns. You know what I'm talking about here? Oh, you did. It's all symmetrical. The city's laid out in the same way. Yeah, exactly. So if you go and you look, the Arc de Triomphe is alongside, and you can literally see the sight lines. So it's beautiful. The city is very picturesque because of that, right? You go to Toronto, and you can't see anything. You can see the CN Tower because it's the highest building. But other than that, it's, is there any order to this at all? Is there any beauty? Did anyone give a thought to what the sight lines would be? And, and in my opinion, the answer is no. It's an ugly city. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't constructed to be beautiful. It wasn't constructed to give you a certain panorama or sight line, none of that. Whereas this is, and you can see though here, the, uh, the trees are equidistant and they're also the same height and they're manufactured, they're, they're cut so they look exactly the same. They could be artificial. That's a certain ideal projected onto nature. It's the, it's the uh, ideal of the enlightenment. Rational thought, ordering, mathematics is governing nature. And that's the right relation. That's the French view of the garden. The English view of the garden is notoriously uh, different, L less ordered, a little bit more natural, a little less artificial. In fact, they don't want the appearance of artifice. English-speaking people tend towards a bias towards nature, as opposed to. Right, and I think I just think that's interesting. It's also interesting that the environmental movement really takes off in countries where that view of nature is held to be uh, more important. 
first uh, natural park world not or the global or a national park is in uh, the Lake District in Britain product of the romantic movement the Germans also so wherever the romanticism is deeply rooted there's a strong bias towards nature being good and it's an anti-christian bias at that because it, it, it opposes the idea that that sin is even in the natural order or that the corruption of sin has affected the natural order yes a fan of gardening no I like the idea but I don't tend to do it very much yeah no I, I'd like I am a fan of it in one sense, but do I do it? And the, and the answer is no. But then ask my wife what I do do, and you might, I won't let you ask her that. <laughs> I do think that there's something good about gardening. Maybe it's some, a, a taste I need to acquire, or a, I, I do think there's a place, it's part of the dominion mandate being put in the garden. There's, it's something about um, looking after something that is under your sort of care and the way you relate to that and there's a great deal of literature written on this in certain periods uh, this is your little world you don't have control over the world outside this is your sphere this is your garden so you can take care of the weeds here you can't take care it's sort of like the Jordan Peterson advice make your own bed right this is your garden you look after your own garden you make sure that you cultivate it you keep out the weeds you give it good nutrition you make sure Right, and there will be benefits to that for you. As opposed to the scientific paradigm, which wants not to look at what's around us and to live in, if you will, a sort of a um, sympathetic arrangement uh, and want to want to improve everything to the point where it looks like this, like the whole world would look like this. Mediterranean gardens, they've never seen a tree that they couldn't put into a pot. If you know what I'm talking about, you go to Greece and Spain and Italy and it's, they put trees in pots. That's not the English way of looking at it. And they don't grow lawns. In, in England, you've got green, vast green spaces. They call them lawns. It's a, it's a view of the relation of us to nature that's expressed in that. It's a very, very English sensibility, also very German sensibility it tends towards fascism. And eugenics. Because what's said to be good in nature can still be improved. But then if you introduce the idea of Darwinism, what's natural is good but can be better. In fact, it's evolving into something better. Well, how do we make it evolve into something better then? You could just say it's going to get better, but nobody's ever satisfied with that. We're going to make it be better. Well, how are you going to do that? Well, you get involved in the reproductive process. And then you have to determine what are the good genes and what are the bad genes. Well, that's easy in relation to some things like genetic uh, like illnesses. So you can say, well, that's, we clearly think that this is not a good genetic trait. But how about things like skin color? How about things like uh, intelligence? Uh, athletic ability. The eugenics movement uh, begins in the late 19th century and it's a part of the whole science fiction thing as well. And it is, that's exactly what's going on on, on on the moon. It's a eugenics project. And it's presented as being a good thing. Wells has no concern about, in fact, the Bedford and Caver admired the Selenites in a sense. I mean, they think that these are odd looking creatures. Like, there's one big fat one, there's the one with the big brain, and you know, they're sort of ugly, but they are very purposeful, the forms of life, and they're harmonious. They live in harmony. There's an ideal happening there. Whenever something's idealized in fiction, you have to wonder what would be the social application back home. And the, so the corresponding novel to this should probably be Brave New World. Yes? In a, in a mathematical way, right? That's the ideal. R reasoning. It's the age of reason. You can see it. Right. But, like, is that, is that post enlightenment? Because if Rousseau sees nature as essentially good and society as corrupting the ideal or how it, you know, its original goodness, then, like, would the, uh, the enlightenment 
Paris do this more the corruption because Versailles is the palace of Louis the Fourteenth. Yeah. He's the bad guy as far as as Rousseau is concerned, okay, right? right? So within France, there's a strong revolt against the idea that we can manage from the top using rationality, right. nature. And in fact, that's the problem. So there's a, an intense irrationalism about R Rousseau. In fact, he says that the, he talks about the feelings of the heart being the es essence of human nature. So this is, the, in a sense, the French ideal. But even within France, there's a, a revolt against that and an appeal to nature against reasoning and society because, because Louis XIV represents the pinnacle of society. And he says that he is an enlightened, uh, I don't know if he uses the word dictator, but an enlightenment ruler. And he does it for the benefit of his people. Well, they, the people of France tend to disagree. <laughs> and, and so there's something, uh, but they do it on the, on, out of a defense of their own nature and the natural world. And it's against this idea. So there's a, even with, there's a tension there that exists in, in France. It's there to a lesser extent in other countries. I see it nowhere stronger than in France, at least the, the tension. Uh, but modern education is, is uh, dominated by Rousseau, interestingly. Anyway, um, so I, I, as I say, I think that Wells is exploring these things in a way that becomes characteristic of science fiction in general. There's this s sense of, uh, of a scientific elite that is malign and probably run by, like, by uh, political figures that are m using the situation for their own personal benefit, like the Davos elite in conspiracy theories of our days, the World Economic Forum and so forth. There are certain wealthy businessmen and tech companies and, and, and life is being orchestrated for the, for the benefit of humanity, but actually is it that beneficial for humanity or is it in fact disadvantaging certain people at the expense of others? It's easy. So it's easy to jump from the premises of science fiction, the way it's portrayed, to what is called a conspiracy theory these days, because that has been laid out as a pattern uh, for the last couple hundred years. And then the question that you have to ask is, is the pattern really there? Are we just imagining it because our, uh, the authors of our fiction have presented it in that way and led us to think that that's the way it is? And I don't know what your answer to that is. I think the poets are right. But, but, uh, but this book is, is the one that Lewis explicitly addresses and says that he loves it. He thinks it's a great example of the sort of science fiction uh, and the best of it of the sort that he wants to respond to. And you can see it in Out of the Silent Planet. That is clearly it. And, when, and interestingly, after he does that, his second work, Paralandra, deals with the same subject matter as Paradise Lost. In other words, the Garden of Eden, and it's on planet Venus. So let's go back to the issue of nature and the right relation of nature and the problems in, incumbent on that. Science fiction cuts God out of the picture. No discussion in H.G. Wells of God at all. The order that he constructs in terms of the cosmos is based on a view of nature in which what we have above the Earth's atmosphere is called outer space. Last semester, I suggested to you that that view of outer space is a very new one. It's a modern one. This is the old cosmology. There's no outer space here. What's a, this is the Earth at the center. The Earth, the Moon, Mercury, Venus, the Sun, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. There are spheres above, above us. There are physical spheres. We, we don't look up and see space. We see something like, a gr like being inside of a big office building where you can, you know, some that have like this foyer and then there are floors that go up 
alongside of it and so you can see up and up but there's something there that's more like the old view of cosmology. You could see something above you, but there, it's not that there's space in between. That is a modern conception based on a different cosmology. I lectured on this last semester, and I direct you to that. But if you're interested in going back and reading it yourself, look at uh, this discarded image by Lewis and look at his discussion of the heavens. What chapter is that? That is chapter six, I think. Five. In this, this is the, um, the uh, empire of heaven, the habitation of God, no, the elect. That's what it says in Latin there. That's outside the visible universe from our conception. So here's the inside and that's the outside. We call it outer space, right? This is inner, that's outer. But that's not how the medievalist looks at it. They see it in a very different way. Because heaven is, is the place that you want to be. That's the inside. That's where real reality resides, in heaven, where God is. He's presented as holy, solid, real. Life here on earth is presented as insubstantial. He explores that in the great divorce. Right? The idea that heaven is a, is a nothing, a place of nothingness or spiritual significance, but there's no physical solidity about it. Well, Lewis's heaven in the, the great divorce is the exact opposite. It's more solid, more real. We can't stand to even stand on the grass there. It cuts the feet of the people that go visit because it's so solid. And furthermore, it is uh, not presented as, as out there. It's presented as being a city on which we are on the outside. Remember the city, God uh, and the heavenly Jerusalem is presented as a city. And if you're not in the city, you're outside the city. So we are outsiders looking in. So Lewis and his fiction will use the old cosmology, which he inherits from the medieval period, as a foil to the fiction of H.G. Uh, Wells, which with his idea of outer space. And so Aslan, when he is bringing about a new heavens and a new earth, he says, come on, children, go further up and further in. Not further out, further in. Up is fine, but in. You're on the outside. You're outside of, you're, you're living in the silent planet. I'll talk about this more when we get to out of the silent planet where he, he draws that and makes it very clear. But the sense of there being a reality above us and us living uh, in, a, in a less substantial reality is an important thing that Lewis wants to reestablish as part of the imaginative structure against science fiction. Because what the effect of science fiction is to think that what we do here on Earth is the most important thing and the most real thing. And so we want to change things here in order to affect real permanent change. You'll hear sociologists talk about this all the time and, and media experts and politicians. We need to get to the causes of these problems and we want to affect meaningful change. And what does that mean? It means social reorganization. And we're gonna get rid of crime. How are we gonna get rid of crime? We're gonna give everybody food and give everybody shelter and so forth and then they won't have any reason for stealing or robbing or eating too much or not sharing things. We just, that's the root cause. That's the Rousseau's view. The problem is that people have not been shared the food enough. But if we just gave everybody an equal portion of food that the government organized, then we would get rid of all the problems that we have. And then you just need the right organizer at the top, the big grand lunar. Prime Minister of Canada will be the grand lunar, I guess. And then distributing and making sure that everyone gets their portion and no more and no less. And uh, life will be better. And we can do it for the benefit of nature. That's the whole premise of the uh, environmental movement right now. Right, because society is, is destroying nature. 
humanity, the growth of humanity destroying nature. Anyway, I'm not, you don't have to agree or disagree with this. I note the, the logic is tied to the same idea. Anyway, when Caver, going back to First Man in the Moon, uh, questions before I move on from that, because I sort of went all over the place. Yes? So we should just lead back into H.G. Wells. So like his view then is more like contrary to Rousseau and the Enlightenment idea, or in line with that? Like kind of I think he is, so science fiction, so there's different stages. In the 18th century, you get these, these, this uh, tension between the rationalists on the one hand and the irrationalists on the other. The rationalists are of the Louis XIV variety. They think that science can be utilized for the betterment of everyone, and the elite, the political elite, just need to direct the process, and everyone will be better off. It's called enlightened absolutism. There is a pushback against it by the irrationalists, the romantics, that say there's something about my nature that's being oppressed by your organizing of society. You're calling it scientific, you're calling it ordered, but all I see is that the family is getting destroyed, that people are being thrown off the land, uh, that you, you say that everyone's getting is better off, but we're starving in the streets. Marie Antoinette, you know, they don't have any bread, let them eat cake, right? She can't imagine what it's like not to have enough food, but the people are starving. It, it turned out that the control over nature wasn't benefiting humanity back then. This is a problem. It, it, read a modest proposal. Same problem there, by H, uh, by, mentioned by uh, Swift. Social organization, benefit, whatever. So there's that early stage when, again, it's being applied directly to nature. Well, that's the, that's the Palace of Versailles. But come the mid-19th century, this is a century and maybe a century and a half later, the scientific elite uh, have basically crushed the Romantic movement. And the Romantics are the backlash against this, the idea that there's something good in nature. And yet, it's not nature per se. So I think within, there are the Romantics that push back, like Rousseau. And then there are the Christians like Lewis and Tolkien, who are going to say, well, the goodness isn't nature per se. It's the, it's the law of nature. It's natural law. There's a, it's the ordering of nature that God has created that's the good. That we need to preserve. It's not nature itself. There's nothing inter inherently good about um, a tree, per se, on its own. But there is a certain order that it, of which it's a part. That's what needs to be preserved. And modern science destroys that sense that there's an, a, there are boundaries and there's a morality that is incumbent upon us to observe in all of our interactions, including with the natural order, but particular in relation to human life. You must not do experiments on people. Eugenics always did experiments on people, always. The Nazis were eugenicists. When they were put on trial, they said to the Americans who put them on trial, we, you guys talk about this all the time. We're just implementing what you guys have said. This is just the court of the victors, but we are doing nothing different than you have been doing in your country for generations. And by the way, they are correct. Eugenics is alive and well in the United States and in Canada. It, it was. And in Britain, for that matter, eugenics was happening. And abortion comes along with it. It's part of the whole same, it's the same movement. And I say it leads to fascism. The reason I said that is if you're looking at the Darwinian view of human nature, then the question is of all of the manifestations of humanity that currently exist on this planet, which is the most evolved and which is the least? That's the invariable question. If it all, it's all coming from the same thing we call humanity, which can we identify as the most evolved and which are not as well evolved? And since this is an impediment to evolution, we got to get rid of the impediment and we'll speed it up. And it'll be better for everyone. 
forced sterilization, euthanasia, et cetera, comes as a result of it. If you read about the tw in the 20th century, read the documents by the political authorities, they talk exactly in these terms. It's the backdrop for uh, Lewis's work at any rate. This is written in 1900. Lewis writes 40 years later, and the 40 years happens to make a big difference as far as that goes. But anyway, back to this. They go to the moon, Caver and Bedford, and while they're on the way there, they experience weightlessness. This is interesting. Uh, weightlessness. Where is this presented here? But they feel like they have no bodies. They're not impeded by that. They, they, they're released from gravity, and they feel good about that. Uh, and then they meet these, these creatures um, called um, selenites, or they call them that. Uh, and the first creatures they meet, they call moon calves, chapter 10. And uh, that's because there are five foot high selenites that are basically milking them or cutting them up in their food. I just want to pick up a little uh, dialogue from chapter 10 here. Uh, because they're eating something um, on the ground, and it's a red, fleshy substance. Monstrous coralline growths. Uh, we pushed against them, and they snapped and broke. I know the quality of the broken surfaces. They can, the confounded stuff certainly looked of a biteable texture. I picked up a fragment and sniffed it. Caver, I said in a hoarse undertone, he, glanced at me with his face screwed up. Don't, he said. I put down the fragment and we crawled on through this tempting fleshiness for a space. Caver, why not? Poison, I heard him say, but he did not look round. He sticks the food in his mouth anyway, or the stuff in his mouth. And Caver looks at him. He says his face wrinkled between desire and disapproval, then suddenly succumbed to appetite. And he began to tear off huge mouthfuls, and then they ate, and they ate, and they ate. It's good, said I, Bedford, infernally good. What a home for our surplus population. Surplus population. What a, what a phrase. What's the surplus population? What does it refer to? Hmm? No, not no, not necessarily. Overpopulation. Overpopulation, yeah. The surplus population. There are too many people on Earth for us to feed, and uh, those people have, um, out of their desperation, they commit criminal acts, they steal, whatever they, right. So here we can deal with the problem of surplus population. Who else will talk like this? Jonathan Swift. Mentioned in Dickens, by the way, also in uh, Christmas Carol. He talks about, as, a, as a surplus, the phrase surplus population is taken directly from the social scientists. And there's an idea that is there from the time of Thomas Malthus that the earth can only sustain so many people. And the problem with, with Versailles and scientific approaches to nature is that we're increasing the yield of the crops. In other words, where people are being better fed. But the problem with that is that more people are alive as a result. And the fear is that they'll get wealthier and consume more and more goods and have more and more children. And eventually, it'll create the perfect storm where there are too many people. And the expectation of that would be well, well fed. And so we have to find a way of culling the human herd, keeping them down to a manageable percentage so that we don't uh, outgrow the, hu the resor Earth's resources. Surplus population. It's from Malthus. Yes? Well, what do you mean by that? Like psychology or like. Psychology, sociology, anthropology. Yeah, like those kind of social sciences, like how do you think they 
Well, they're part of this whole project, but I'm not sure what you're asking, but they're, because they're, they, they are in sync with this, we want to make the world use uh, the sciences related to people and how people, human nature, how people relate to one another, and we wanted to do it to make a mar more harmonious social environment. That's the aim. Okay. That's their aim. I have noted about them that they never define what human nature is. Yeah even amongst themselves, even in psychology, they haven't defined what a psyche is. Is it the brain? Is it the mind? Is it the soul? Is it, well, I mean, what is it? It's not an unimportant question for a science if you can't define the basic thing that you're studying. <laughs> yeah. um, and a certain view of, of life, I think, has to be brought to the table as well. What's the purpose of science? Not just what is science and what, what is it you're studying, but what What's the purpose of science? Is it to improve human nature? I think it's the social sciences invariably are Darwinist before Darwin. They think it is to improve human nature. Is that a Christian view? Is that the purpose of education? Is it to improve human nature? That's the transhumanist view that we're going to find in this fiction as well. And uh, I don't think the Christian view is to improve human nature because I don't think we can improve something that we're not masters of and we're not masters of ourselves. We are creatures. The, the historic understanding of the, pa the task of education uh, is uh, articulated by Milton in his little work of education. He says it's to restore the ruins of our first parents by learning to know God aright. So it's a recovery of what's been lost rather than a, a discovery of new things. No, so note the difference there. A recovery of lost things as opposed to an in, a discovery of new things. And that in, in Frankenstein, it did exactly that. He was go, they were going to discover new things, including uh, not just the Arctic, but we're going to discover, we're going to violate our own ethics in order to create a new form of life. Ignoring all the moral sanctions that they ought to have about and reservations they ought to have about doing such things. Is there a Christian way of doing psychology and anthropology and sociology and so forth? There probably is, but it would be at odds with the way the disciplines were constructed and currently operate. At the good society? Yeah. Yes. Yep, very much so. In fact, that's exactly what they want to do. Because in science fiction, it presents uh, a certain view of what's wrong. I think, so when I read Orwell and when I read Huxley, I think they're very sharp in being able to depict the dangers of this outlook uh, projected forward. You can see. If we, based on our certain our own assumptions about what we do and why we do it and so forth, here's where we're going to end up. I think they're very good on that. 1984 looks prophetic. So does Brave New World. It looks prophetic. What they never do is they can't see an alternative to that. They have it's a it's a council of despair in which they operate. And I think both Tolkien and Lewis do the opposite. They present a world as it ought to be. and present it in conjunction with how it actually is or should or was originally intended. So it's a recovery of what's lost rather than a uh, discovery of what has never been. And what would you say were like examples of that in your works? We're about to come to them. All th all, so the three sci-fi novels are an example. There will, the, the, the bad guys will be there, but so will the good guys throughout all three works of Lewis. Same thing in uh, Tolkien. I think there is a portrait of the ideal society or the in ideal individual uh, very strongly presented there. A, an idea of the good that is opposed to this, this uh, tendency they see in science fiction. And I think it fits more with 
with, uh, with a Christian view. The end of the book of Re Revelation, Christ says, behold, I'm making all things new. He doesn't say I'm making all new things. I'm taking all what's there and I'm renewing. But what was good is going to be good without the bad. It's getting rid of the bad. That's what making all things new is. It's not just doing new things for the sake of doing new things. Making them new, as in restoring. That's how I take it at any rate. And I think that is part of the dominion mandate in Genesis 1 as well. Adam and Eve are told to make an Eden out of the whole earth. They're, they're in the Garden of Eden. They're to cultivate it. And they're to have children, and they're, and they're to make the whole of the earth into an Eden, which it is not yet. That's their task. And they're to do it under, under, uh, in relationship with God. They violate that relationship. Now it's no longer a template for us. In fact, it's a, a warning what happens when you take uh, your own future into your own hands. Anyway, um, so they eat this, and again, the surplus population's common. I just had to mention this. Caver replied to my third repetition of my surplus population remark with similar words of approval. I felt that my head swam, but I put this down to the stimulating effect of food after a long fast. Excellent discovery, or Caver said, I send on you the tattoo. What's, what do you mean? And now so they're sort of slurring. Maybe it got some alcohol in it or something, I don't know. But both men are, again, this is chapter 10, it's page 59, if you've got this version. Um, both men are happy that will address the problem of the surplus population. They're very worried about this. Whether the businessmen or the scientists, this is their uh, grand concern. They see the face of the seal in it. I'll skip over that. This, I want to just read extracts here. Chapter 12, and he's dealing with the nature of the Selenites. What does he say? Um, these creatures, page 68, bottom of the 68, these creatures, the Selenites, or whatever, whatever we choose to call them, have got us tied hand and foot. Whatever temper you choose to go through with it in, you'll have to go through with it. We have experiences before us that will need all our coolness. He pauses if he required my assent, but I sat sulking. Confound your science, I said. The problem is communication. Gestures, I fear, will be different. Pointing, for example. No creatures but men and monkeys point. That was too obviously wrong for me. Pretty nearly every animal, I cried, points with its eyes or nose. Caver meditated over that. Yes, he said at last, and we don't. There are such differences, such differences. One might, but how can I tell? There's speech, the sounds they make, a sort of fluting and piping. I don't see how we're to imitate that. Is it their speech, that sort of thing? They may have different senses, different means of communication. Of course, they are minds and we are minds. There must be something in common. Who knows how far we may not get to an understanding. The things are outside us. I said, they're more different from us than the strangest animals on earth. They are a different clay. What is the good of talking like this? Caver thought. I don't see that. Where there are minds, they will have something similar, even though they have been evolved on different planets. Of course, if it was a question of instinct, if we or they were no more than animals, well, are they? says Bedford. They're much more like ants on their hind legs than human beings, and whoever get, got to any sort of understanding with ants. But these machines and clothing, no, I don't hold with you, Bedford. The difference is wide. It's insurmountable. So now they're getting into the discussion of if there are other beings, uh, how much like us, uh, how much common ground do we have? And wherein would that lie? And for the scientists, it must reside in the intellect. It must, they must have the capacity for human reasoning, or what we call reason, reasoning, which human beings also partake in, just as the angels do. For all that difference. But he says, it's clear they are intelligent. One can hypothesize certain things. As they have not killed us at once, 
they must have ideas of mercy. Mercy at any rate of restraint, possibly of intercourse. They may meet us, and this apartment and the glimpses we had of its guardian, these fetters, a high degree of intelligence. Anyway, so they, ima they are at, at present prisoners, and they are imagining what these beings who are not human will do with them, imagining that they have capacities like us, but whereas they clearly also have capacities that are not like ours. Interesting speculation there. When, when, when they find we have reasonable minds, says Caver, this is the next chapter, they will want to learn about the earth. Even if they have no generous emotions, they will, they will teach in order to learn. And the things they must know, the unanticipated things. And he went on to speculate on the possibility of their knowing things he had never hoped to learn on earth, speculating in that way with a raw wound from that goad already in his skin. Much that he said I forgot for my attention was drawn to the fact that the tunnel along which we had been marching was opening out wider and wider. But note how uh, Caver is more like the, the real scientist. He, he loves knowledge for the sake of knowledge. He will learn new things that he would never have learned had he stayed on planet Earth. Bedford has no such interest. But there's something good in Caver here, which uh, Lewis is going to hold on to when he portrays his own science, scientist uh, in uh, the uh, first one, not the first moon, moon uh, of the silent planet. Uh, what they discover in chapter 15 is that there's an intellectual hierarchy. Quote, this is Caver. He discovered a new line of possibilities. Well, suppose we got ourselves into some corner where we could defend ourselves against these hinds and laborers. If, for example, we could hold out for a week or so, it is probable that the news of our appearance would filter down to the more intelligent and populous parts. If they exist, they must exist. Or whence come these tremendous machines? That's possible, but it's the worst of the two chances. He, we might write up inscriptions on walls. How do we know their eyes could see the marks we made? If we cut them, that's possible, of course. I took up a new thread of thought. After all, I said, I suppose you don't think these Selenites so infinitely wiser than men. They must know a lot more, or at least a lot of different things. Anyway, lots of speculation going on there. Let me come to the point in chapter uh, where, because um, they end up killing a few of the Selenites in the process of trying to escape. And they are brought to, uh, they are brought to the superior intelligence that they simply presented as a hypothesis. And um, fight in the cave of the moon butchers is in 16. They go back to the sunlight in 17. And the one that I find particularly fascinating is chapter 19. Mr. Bedford in infinite space. Because Bedford escapes and Caver doesn't. He goes back on his own. He goes back with gold, which he's found there. He goes back and he's going to get very rich out of this. But Caver's left there as a, as a prisoner. And while he's going back, what, this is very interesting, because he goes back and he, spec he speculates on how he feels in, while he is in what he perceives as infinite space. And uh, he says this, incredible, and this is while he's on his voyage back, as incredible as it will seem, the interval of time that I spent in space has no sort of proportion to any other interval of time in my life. Sometimes it seems as though I sat through immeasurable eternities, like some god upon a lotus leaf, and again as though there was a momentary pause as I journeyed from moon to earth. In truth, it was altogether some weeks of earthly time, but I had done with care and anxiety, hunger or fear for that space. I floated. And he says he can't really explain what happened to him. But, it, but the, this is page 116. The most prominent quality of the feeling he had was a pervading doubt of my own identity. I became, if I may so express it, dissociate from Bedford. I looked down on Bedford as a trivial, incidental thing with which I chanced to be connected. I saw Bedford in many relations, 
as an ass or as a poor beast, where I had hitherto been inclined to regard him with a quiet pride as a very spirited and rather forcible person. I saw him not only as an ass, but as the son of many generations of asses. I reviewed his school days and his early manhood and his first encounter with love very much as one might review the proceedings of an ant in the sand. So what he's describing here is the effect of being in outer space on considering your own human nature because he feels abstracted from it. He's no longer in relationship with people. In other words, he's like Victor Frankenstein. He sees himself not in relation with other people, but above them. And he has contempt for human nature in a relational fashion. The, more, the higher he gets, and literally in outer space, the more he tends to look on all of life, including his own physical life, as something to have contempt for. I, I mention that because this will be uh, a sensation that will echo um, in Lewis's fiction, but also note what I said last time about Descartes and his view of human nature as a, uh, a, a mind inside of a machine, a thinking substance, if, and he thinks of it, even his body as something distinct and alien from him, as a sort of a substance. That's effect of the, the uh, rational world view and it gets enhanced by being in outer space. And he's terrified in the midst of that. By the way, that's Pascal's observation about the cosmology here. He says that the, uh, eternal, the, eternal, the vast spaces of infinity, infinite space terrify him, something like that. And so he has the first experience of what we call agoraphobia. Unknown to the uh, world up until that time. But at the end of the novel, I'll show you running out of time. At the end of the novel, I have two minutes. Um, when he arrives back home, uh, he uh, interacts with the um, he manages to get a communication going. How does he do that again? I think a boy gets capped, uh, gets uh, uh, Tommy Simmons. Yeah, he, he goes into the unattended sphere and he goes <laughs> off <laughs> up into space. Oops, that was a mistake. Um, and uh, and he writes, and this is sort of interesting. In uh, the Strand magazine, he writes that Doc Mr. Julius Wendegree, a Dutch electrician, has been experimenti experimenting with certain apparatus akin to the apparatus used by Mr. Tesla in America. Have you heard of Tesla? Yeah, anyway. Um, and, he, and he has picked up fragments of radio communication from Caver, from inside the moon. They're going back and forth. like, uh, and, and because Caver has taught the Selenites English, and they are getting information from him. And some of that is captured in 23, the natural history of the Selenites, how they came about and so forth. But that's finding out about them when it comes the other way around and the Grand Lunar finds about human nature, it gets worse and worse. And he seems to be un unaware of the consequences of revealing um, these things. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, the last section I'm gonna read here is from uh, 23. In the moon, says Caver, every citizen knows its place. He is born to that place and the elaborate discipline of training and education and surgery he undergoes fits him at last so completely to it that he has neither ideas nor organs for any purpose beyond it. Why should he? The faculty of laughter, save for the sudden discovery of some paradox, is lost to him. His deepest emotion is the evolution of a novel computation, and so he attains his end. So they're bred to be satisfied with the limitations of their physical body. So there's a differentiation, and they no longer have a common lunar nature, effectively. There is no such thing as a common rationality, a common imago dei, anything like that. They're, but they're totally satisfied. These beings with big heads to whom the intellectual labors fall form a sort of aristocracy in this strange society. And at the head of them, quintessential of the moon, is that marvelous, gigantic ganglion, the grand lunar, into whose presence I am finally to come. 
The unlimited development of the minds of the intellectual class is rendered possible by the absence in the lunar anatomy of bony skull. That strange box of bone that clamps about the developing brain of man, Im imperiously insisting that thus far and no farther to all his possibilities. So the future evolution of mankind is the evolution of the brain by taking out the skull and just letting the brain grow. Because the, the skull is a limitation on the development of that Cartesian essential self. And then there'll be the specialization that will go along with that. Anyway, I think I've run out of time here. I, I'll say a little bit more in conclusion about this next time. But then we're going to go to the abolition of man. I'm not going to re... Uh, well, I'll give you a little summary of the first chapter. Uh, but I'm going to spend the majority of my time on the third chapter, which is specifically the abolition of man, because that's where he talks about the scientists. Okay? Well, I'll see you next time. Apologies for...